Yeah, thanks for that. Um, actually, I never thought that uh, the talk I'm going to present to you just set up like that, because when I just first did the talk, uh, I just presented it at a conference in Lisbon, and uh, there were like half of the audience or just a third of the audience, and now it's just, yeah, a whole audience here in Stockholm of interested people in passports and also people on the internet, so thanks for joining my talk. Actually, I could have sensed that before, because when I was in Lisbon uh, presenting my talk, there was someone in the audience who was very interested in, uh, in my talk, and he looked exactly like David Hasselhoff. And uh, basically, because we're, we're like from Germany, and you know Germany and David Hasselhoff, I mean, that must be a very good sign. So thank you for joining your talk, and if you don't know what this guy is talking about, just Google David Hasselhoff and Berlin Wall, you will enjoy it. So um, yeah, just... but. Now to something serious, um, I would like to ask you in the crowd, just raise your hands on the count of three, if that matches uh, your experience. Uh, who, is you, who of you has logged into Google in the last couple of days? One, two, three? Okay, oh yeah, a lot of people. And who of you just got this message then? One, two, three? Yeah, some people, I think, yeah, you may be not located in Stockholm, I guess. So basically, that's what we're going to talk about in the next 20 minutes. That is risk-based authentication, and uh, yeah, I didn't introduce myself. So uh, my name is Stefan Wiefling. I'm uh, from the TH Köln, the Cologne University of Applied Sciences. And this is joint work together with Luigi Luyakono, also from Cologne University of Applied Sciences, and Markus Dürrmuth from Ruhr University Bochum. And uh, yeah, as introduced before, this is about risk-based authentication. So we just uh, did an empirical study just to find out uh, how risk-based authentication works on online services. And there's some inter interesting stuff uh, that is going to be at the end. But uh, first of all, um, what are we going to talk about? I mean, of course, yeah, we are at the Passwords conference, so we're basically talking about passwords. So I think you probably should all know these uh, kind of things. You have the username and you enter the password and it's almost deployed in almost 100% of all online services. So why is that? I think one of the main reasons here uh, could be from a developer perspective. I mean, you can basically just check two combinations, username, password, and then it's done. So from the developer perspective, it's easy to implement. And from the user perspective, if you just see something like that, then you know, oh yeah, I have to enter my email address in the first field and the password in the second field. So it's also for the users very easy to remember. And I mean, this technology is very old. Um, we, there are some papers from the 1970s that also covered passwords, and uh, we all know about these weaknesses in passwords. If you choose uh, long passwords, they are not that easy to remember, uh, but harder to crack. And if you select like shorter passwords, they are uh, yeah, easy to remember, but uh, yeah, e crackable with rainbow tables, as we know it here. So, um, <laughs> That's the kind of thing we're, uh, we know for years. Uh, but however, the risks uh, or the security risks in passwords just increase over the last couple of years. Maybe you know, like the password leaks, like the Rocky leak or LinkedIn leak. So basically, um, you can get all these username and password database combinations uh, as an attacker, and you can basically just enter them automatically on an online service. And uh, since we're all humans, I mean, I pled guilty there as well, so we probably just reuse passwords across multiple online services. And if you just try to enter them automatically, you probably get in with a very high chance. And there was also like an attack just presented at the CCS 90, uh, 2016, the intelligent password guessing. So they were basically just able um, just to derive passwords based on like social engineering. So just finding out who's the person and they were just able to get in with their framework uh, in with, with the average user that did some testing and they were able to get into the online account with less than 100 guesses. So. This uh, shows that we need to somehow implement measures to protect our users more better because like passwords doesn't seem to be enough here. And uh, what are online services doing right now in practice? Most of them are just doing two-factor authentication. So basically, you're just uh, entering username and password. Then you just get asked for an additional factor. This is probably uh, like a six-digit code just uh, textually that is phone, and then you just enter them and uh, yeah. The problem is here, unfortunately, that it's kind of like unpopular among users because Google themselves had a presentation at the Enigma conference and they had to yeah, said 
uh, although Google is just promoting to factor authentication since 2011, that just less than 10% are actually opted in for two-factor authentication. So this is a big problem because we need to protect somehow these 90% of the users that do not have two-factor authentication enabled here. And this is where risk-based authentication comes into play. So this is basically uh, yeah, an authentication technique that increases the password, uh, you, you, the security of password-based authentication with just minimal impact on the user authentication. And this is why, for example, services like Google, they are just using also risk-based authentication. And um, this is how it works in principle. So uh, we are just a normal user trying to log in with the stuff we know, username, password. And uh, when you submit the login form, you also submit additional metadata. This is, for example, like the IP address or the browser you're using, uh, the device, the time, and so on. And this goes into the backend of the risk-based authentication engine. And there, they just calculate the risk, how highly it is, how highly is the risk that this uh, login attempt was a hacking attempt. And this is based on literature. This is just uh, yeah, just categorized into three categories. So we're just going into the three categories. And um, this is like the simple example. We assume that we live here in Stockholm. We're just a normal uh, university student, for example, using Windows 10. Yeah, some of you are probably using Linux. Uh, but just assume a normal user here, just using a Windows 10 computer. Uh, and logging in from Stockholm. So this is just a normal user case. They're just checking uh, the login history of the user. And if it just says like Stockholm is like the normal use case, you're just getting in like always. Uh, in the second case, we're just switching a little bit uh, the location of our device. So probably we're just moving into another country and using a device that we've never used before. So in our example, just an Android phone. So uh, this was never used before. So our risk engine just is not very sure if we're actually the user that we are pretending to be. So they're just asking for additional authentication in that case. And this is in some cases, Chris, we just logged in with an email address and a password in most cases. So they are just sending a six digit code, for example, to the email address. So we need to log in into your email account to get the code. Then you just paste it. And if you just got the proof correctly, then you're just logged in into the online service. So this is kind of like what, what's unique about risk-based authentication here, just compared to the what we call uh, two-factor authentication here. So, um, but yeah, we also have the high-risk case. Uh, I th think we just saw it in the talk or some ten times before here. Um, if you have a very high risk, then we're just getting locked out. But if you just act like a very dumb bot here, like using an uh, IP address that is very suspicious and uh, like a browser that is not normally used here. So um, yeah, then we're just getting locked out here. However, I would like to say that this should be a very rare case, but uh, because you always need to make sure that you're letting, you're, you're now a normal online service, so you shouldn't lock out the users that are legitimate users. And perhaps I'm just a normal user that really likes to lock, to use PhantomJS for private reasons and Linux. So uh, if that case happens, I would get locked out of my uh, account and I would have problems. So you really have to care about that. A risk-based authentication is uh, recommended in the NIST Digital Identity Guidelines, so it's getting more and more important. And uh, at the time we did the study, uh, there were, was not much information about that, so how our online services are actually using it. They were not really sharing that experience, and we thought that it's uh, yeah, somehow preventing the widespread adoption because we thought it's uh, also useful for small and medium websites, so they can also implement risk-based authentication to uh, protect their users, so more knowledge, more people getting protected by RBA. So uh, what did we do? Uh, we've tried to find out uh, how the online services are actually using risk-based authentication, and uh, we did black box testing. So uh, I think you probably have a user accounts on these online services on some of them. So uh, we just tried to find out by, based on the reaction of the online services, how are they basically using RBA. So this is how it works in principle. Um, we have like, yeah, we are the normal user, and we just want to investigate an online service here. However, we don't know what's inside the online services, so it's basically a black box online service. And uh, but, however, since we just uh, yeah scanned the literature, we know, however, in a little bit how risk-based authentication could work at these online services. So we just made up a login table, and uh, we just uh, try to log in 
multiple times at the online service because we know we need to train the online service with legitimate behavior here. So we conducted 20 online uh, login sessions here with always the same parameter, so just selecting the same IP address, similar login times, and so on. And uh, after that, after we conducted the 20 sessions, the online service just knows what is the normal behavior, and then we just switch to the hacker perspective and just varied one parameter here in our simple example, and uh, then we just, uh, yeah, conducted a login session. For example, if we just switch the IP address, and then we look at the reaction. Will we get in? Will we get asked for additional authentication? Or will we get locked out? And if you see a different reaction than just getting locked in here, then we know that th this feature that we just varied here is used in the RBA uh, calculation uh, mechanism of the online service we investigated. So this is just, uh, yeah, the simple overview, how it works. We have just ever, uh, it wasn't, that simple because, uh, yeah, if you know, can imagine we have just created an account, created a lot of user sessions and logged in. So probably after we just triggered RBA, this uh, we can't use that account anymore. So we needed to create a lot of user accounts just to test it here. And uh, unfortunately, our inter institute doesn't have the money just to pay like 100 students that we can just pay for logging in and online services and conduct user sessions. So you need to automate that in some way. And... Uh, that was the second problem we encountered here, of course, because, um, yeah, automatic testing, of course, influences the results because they're doing, like, bot detection and so on. So we needed to imitate humans as closely as possible. So we created human-like usage behavior here with a framework that we just developed for our studies here. So how did it look like? We actually created virtual identities, so 28 virtual identities here, so every person we just imitated here has a different, like they just typed in a different way, selected different categories on the website and so on, with a lot of randomness. So uh, just to uh, simulate as good as possible. And this goes into our RBA inspection tool that we just developed. So um, they were just also browsing on the online services, like uh, conducting and they just locked in, locked out on all the eight online services, and when they were locked in, they were also conducting actions that were just typical for online services, like browsing for articles or uh, adding stuff into the basket case and so on. And, but it always differs with each session, of course, because if we just do it the same way or all the time, uh, it would get labeled as suspicious, of course. And they also visited search engines, which is not uh, stated here. Uh, but they also visited a search engine and entered queries that are just covered in current events and media. So they were just opening different websites and multiple tabs, keeping the cookies. And uh, we just hope that these online services also track us on other websites. So if they track us on other websites and we're just doing like two-hour login sessions that we just did here, uh, then we just assume that we just get labeled as a normal user here. And this is all just for reproducibility issues. We just uh, just locked it into a database so we can always see which kind of button did they click at which time and what was the outcome at the end. So, uh, yeah, this is how it looked like. And, uh, yeah, the problem is here. Uh, there is a lot of potential features that could be used for RBA, so we need to somehow test the most relevant ones uh, just to find that out. Because if you just take a look at the browser features with JavaScript, there's like a huge list you could just read out. And uh, yeah, since we need to uh, do the study as, uh, as we saw here, it's a bit difficult. So we just tested the most relevant ones. So we just uh, checked the RBA literature and uh, just saw where's the highest mention. So this is likely used in RBA. And uh, also, uh, there's a paper by Alakan von Orschott. So they just rated different features in terms of how, uh, high, how much information do they give you for fingerprinting. So we just combined them the two. And you can see there's a lot of stuff that you can basically read out, like ad blocker detection or just counting hosts behind uh, a router and so on. And uh, also, yeah, how do you type and click? And uh, these are the five ones, uh, the highest rating we just uh, selected here for analyzing. So the IP address, uh, the user agent string, um, the language, and the browser resolution, and uh, also the time that we use to log in into these online services. So uh, yeah, these were just the selection we just used here. And it's still not that easy, because uh, yeah, we selected the IP address as a feature. So um, you can imagine the IP address, you can 
derive a lot of information from it. So basically, it could be the same city, it could be the same city with a different uh, internet service provider, it could be a different uh, city in the same country, and so on. So uh, we needed to figure out first, uh, we just conducted a two-part study. In the first study, we needed to figure out first um, at which part, so we just varied like different city, different country, and so on. And um, then we just try to figure out... Ah, yeah, thanks for listening to my talk online. So uh, whoever has got the phone in, <laughs> that's great. So one viewer here, again, more. Um, yeah, we just, but just to come back here, uh, we just check the IP address. So at which part will RBA be triggered? So we have the point here. And then for the second study, so we just to make sure that the IP address did not trigger RBA alone, we just selected the IP address one step uh, below the threshold, and then we just switched all the other parameters. So uh, if we combine them, we were just able to find out uh, how which parameter just triggered RBA here. So here are our results of the first study. So uh, we just needed to figure out the threshold here. Uh, so as you can see, most of the online services, they trigger if you just uh, select to a different country here. But some of them, like uh, there's a gaming uh, website, gog.com, uh, they triggered, if you just vary the subnet, uh, just a small bit at the end of the IP address, and it always triggers RBA. So there are some variations here. And uh, yeah, just imagine if you're just selecting a different country here, then we just selected the threshold here for the ne next study, and uh, that's what we did here. So selecting the threshold as I said before, and then the other parameters we just selected to as suspicious as possible. So if it's got triggered, then we can see results. And you could see it uh, if you take a look at the Google uh, example, for example, if you just vary one parameter, you, you get a security warning in some cases here. So we know that this uh, somehow triggered or is evaluated for risk-based authentication. And um, if we take a look at some more, at one uh, at the time parameter, so if you just um, adding the time here, it, at one point, uh, IP and user agent won't trigger it here. You, you can see that there's nothing that is triggered, but if you just add the time parameter here, you will get a warning and uh, yeah, you get locked out and asked for additional information and get a different type of email sent. So based on that, we, we could derive uh, that there are some different weightings here in the risk-based authentication mechanism. And uh, it's similar to LinkedIn, where we just it did not trigger with uh, one parameter, but if we combine two, it will always trigger RBA in these cases. So we knew that uh, yeah, we have these features also included. At the end, uh, you can see that uh, yeah, all the services we tested here and those that triggered RBA, they use the IP address as a higher weighted feature. And some of them, um, based on the directions we saw, have different weightings here. Um, as they used here, like the time for, for example, was weighted higher than the other ones we assumed here. And uh, how does it look like if you just trigger RBA? Here are some dialogues here. So um, some of them are also offering different kind of uh, verification features. Um, like okay, the most obvious one, I think, is just sending a digit code to a phone or just to an email address. But some, like Facebook, for example, um, they offer like a feature where you can just identify pictures of friends, so just showing you a picture, and you have to identify who is that person, um, and then you get in if you just have five successful tries, I think. Uh, yeah, and I think the Google know, uh, the Google one you always know. Uh, I think kind of interesting is in the case of LinkedIn, they have two different types of dialogues. If you just trigger RBA on a desktop device, uh, you will get this dialog, so they won't show you much information where you get the code. And if you just trigger it on a mobile device, uh, you will get. They will show you the email address where they send uh, the authentication code. And uh, yeah, as we, as I said before, we have some a lot of features that are offered here. Perhaps interesting also uh, in terms of Google. Google sometimes asks you if they don't have that much information about you. Uh, they just ask for the city you're usually logging in from. So that was something special we didn't find at the other online services. But however, verification code seems to be uh, like the state of the art here uh, based on our, our analytics here. Um, What's also interesting, we found a privacy leak on Facebook. So uh, if you just get, imagine you're like an attacker just trying to get into the account and Facebook just detects that you're like the hacking attempt. So you're getting locked out, so that's good. But um, 
Unfortunately, if you use the text uh, a code to your phone feature, so you just clicked it, and then they ask you for phone number, so for security reasons, so you need to normally complete it, but if you press the back button, they just leak the full phone number of your target, so you were basically just able to get the phone number. Um, so, uh, yeah, but so we thought that this is not uh, how it's intended to be, uh, so we just reported it to Facebook here, and uh, yeah, they really responded quickly and just fixed it two days after our responsible dis disclosure, so that's basically a very good behavior of them, so it also shows that uh, doing research on RBA uh, also helps all the people, so also making your accounts more secure, and uh, yeah, so basically... That was a very good sign here, so also the very quick reaction here. So uh, just to conclude here, so you just got an overview of RBA here, and just to conclude, uh, we have the online services, and yeah, most of them uh, use the IP address as a high-weighted feature, and like verification code seems to be the state of the art here in risk-based authentication at the time we did the study here. And um, yeah, some services also use additional authentication factors, however, we have to say that this list is, of course, not complete. It's just based on the evidence we got here. So it could be that they're also doing additional analytics, but these are the ones that we got reactions to. So, it, yeah, it could be that they also used more of them. So, uh, yeah, just to conclude, you have some insights here. If you're just interested in more information on RBA, we just got more results that couldn't fit here. Uh, the presentation here, just go on our website, riskbasedauthentication.org. We also set up like models of how RBA works at different online services based on the reactions we got here. So if you're interested in it, just check it out. Similar, the tool that we use here to analyze uh, the black box online services, it's also uh, open source. So just go on GitHub, uh, open the Hosit website here, and uh, then you can just use it. So um, yeah. Thanks for your attention, and uh, if you've got any questions, uh, just drop me a message uh, if you're online, or I'm on Twitter as well, of course, or just ask the questions here. So thanks for your attention here. <laughs>